So I think the preparation breeds confidence and the confidence will help your performance. It's not the, it's not the end all be all, but I do think that gives you a little bit more, um, you know, mental fortitude than somebody who isn't as confident or did not put in the work. You can be a great athlete. And I know so many great athletes that, I outperformed or went further than because they were just, they, they just relied on their, their skill set or athleticism or size yeah. or whatever, and they stopped working. Um, and so if you continue to put the work in, like I always say, is try to beat the math. However you can beat the math, you need to, you know, all right, well, so-and-so's working out this month. Well, how can you do a little bit more so you're ahead of them and you've already caught up to them or surpassed them whenever you see them next? I'm excited for you to see this week's episode, but before we get to that, I have a message for you. If you're a parent of an elite athlete or a coach of a high-performing team and you want you're looking for some help or assistance with making them more mentally resilient, perform with more confidence, be more consistent, anything like that, then this is for you. I have an eight-week program all designed to address exactly that, to help your athlete be at their best on a more consistent basis and not get tripped up by those little voices in their head and getting down on themselves for mistakes, but performing like we know they can. So what I want you to do is don't delay, schedule a, just grab a time on my calendar through this link and let's set up a time to talk about your specific situation and how what I'm offering in my eight-week program can help. Okay, so it's brindresher.com forward slash free consultation. So click this link, grab a time on my calendar. I look forward to talking to you. And now on to this week's episode. Welcome everyone to another amazing episode of the Mental Advantage podcast. I'm excited to be here with our guest today. We have the fabulous Chris McSwain. Chris McSwain. How are you doing today, Chris? I'm doing fantastic. I'm excited to uh, jump on your show and, and talk about the mind and, and how how it all works with athletics and, and beyond that. So I'm excited. Awesome. 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 So speaking of, I, I, I don't know if you know the premise of this podcast, we talked to, I know you are an, ath, an ex-athlete or I don't know if we ever lose that athlete designation. I always feel weird saying it. How do you feel about that? <laughs> I think I'm always an athlete, um, yeah. even in our even in our team building. We just did a team building at a little putt putt golf, and that uh, that that mindset never really goes anywhere. So uh, even if it's if it's ping pong or putt putt golf or any other activity, I'm trying to win for sure. Okay, all right, well, good. So we're on the same page on that. Uh, but the the competitiveness obviously stays there. All of the great things, and we'll get to that because that's so important. Uh, but one of the premises of the podcast is talking to, uh, you know, this idea of the superhero journey, right? And yeah. I love origin stories. So tell yeah. me, I know you're a basketball coach now. Was basketball your sport? Was it the first sport you picked up? Tell me a little bit about your beginnings in sport and then how you kind of transitioned into, what you know, uh, basketball being your sport, if it was. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, thank you for the question. I love origin stories as well. It kind of gives you a, a background to the painting. You could see yes. this masterpiece and you don't know where the background came from, but all the colors that kind of mold together end up shaping who you are. And more importantly, all the blemishes that you have too. You know, uh, I think that's a part of your struggle. I love scars and things like that. Mm. You know, my kids will look at me and they say, Daddy, you got some scars on your knees. I said, yeah, that's that's because I've been through some things. And um, I, think that's, I think that's an important important part of the uh, of the tale. But to answer your question, I grew up playing uh, multiple sports here in the Bay Area. I still live uh, in, in San Jose, California. And uh, I used to play everything growing up. Uh, one, because my mom was the one who who raised me um, basically since I was eight all the way up. So she would have to have me in activities. So, you know, I wouldn't be either getting in trouble or you just, you know, there's, right. you can just get into a lot of things as a kid, but uh, football, basketball, and baseball were my main sports. But I even did like, uh, I did roller hockey. I did skateboard. I did a whole bunch of different things because I was just, uh, I, I just had a naturally good hand-eye coordination. Mm -hmm. um, so baseball was actually my best sport growing up and uh, I played all three sports in high school, but I had to make a decision because AAU basketball and baseball were in the same season. So I decided to go with the much more fast paced, cooler sport in my opinion at that time. And I decided to stay with 
uh, with a basketball. Um, and so after my sophomore year, I didn't play baseball anymore. And then uh, football as well. I played football, you know, four years in high school, basketball four years in high school, but baseball two years. I probably should have stayed with baseball because I was pretty darn good at baseball. My hand-eye coordination, like I mentioned, was just very good. Um, and it's always been naturally good. Um, and then uh, I decided to play college football. I had a couple opportunities to do that. So I decided to play college football instead of basketball. But basketball has always been my first love. So baseball is my best sport. Uh, I played college football and basketball has always been my love. And uh, yeah, so that was kind of wow. kind of the kind of the journey with sports. But um, yeah, that's a that's a quick high level overview. All right. So I'm committed. First of all, thank you for that journey through your uh, beginnings of sport. I am committed to uh, diversity of sport on this podcast. So you had me at roller hockey. Yeah. Uh, first of all, being a person of color, you probably don't hear that as much. Now, obviously, I didn't grow up in the Bay Area, so maybe yeah. it was a huge thing in uh, yeah. people of color. But how would you get involved in roller hockey? You know, it's just uh, kind of the, the habitat that you're in. Um, you know, you grew up in the Bay Area specifically. We call it uh, basically a, a mosh pit of different ethnicities. And so you're exposed to a lot of different things. That's why I really love being here. It's so diverse. And you're going to see every every culture in this area. I grew up with, you know, my, my friends were Black, white, Asian, Indian, Hispanic, you name it. And it was just a beautiful thing because we really grew up to see no color. And so when it came to uh, trying out something different, it wasn't, it wasn't an easy, it wasn't a hard sell. It was an easy one because that was what everybody was doing. And it didn't matter what you look like. And, and I, I didn't just play basketball because I was black or African American yeah. and, and they didn't play hockey just because they were white or, or whatever, but all, all our friends played it no matter what their race was and you know all, literally all my friends are basically like the united nations like on my wedding it was uh it was really every ethnicity ethnicity in my wedding party that was covered and and i think that's such a great thing and a benefit that to growing up to where i you know i grew up i love that i love that um i'm biracial myself i grew up in a predominantly white suburb outside of chicago and i have a you know mixture of friends as well and uh, I will always think about this kid from college. Uh, <laughs> and it was, you know, I grew up in that environment, so it was so normal for me. But he was right. from probably the Detroit area and because I went to Michigan State. And he said uh, yeah, one time, me and my friend Carl, he was like, how do you talk to them? And I was like, well, who? Mm -hmm. And he was like, white people. <laughs> I was like, oh, I, was, I don't know. I'll just do it. But yeah. it was like, you know, just that whole world of probably being on either side and sometimes feeling that's foreign just for lack of exposure. So it sounds great that you had such yeah. a diversity. And what, uh, and what, uh, you know, what is your, what are both races, your mom and dad? What uh, are they? Uh, my mom is white and my dad is black, but I was raised by my mother. So my, yeah. similar to you, like you said, from eight on, but pretty much my whole life, my mom yeah. was my sole parent. So I had very little exposure to, I mean, my mom did make sure that, I mean, I've always known who my father was. We were around him um, when he would come to town or she would make sure we saw him. But in general, she was the sole parent. So, yeah. And that's, you know, the reason why I asked that is because my children are, are, are interracial as well. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to shield them from either part of their life, whether it be white or black. Yeah. I want them to understand that they are they are good enough no matter what their ethnicity is. And I Absolutely. say, you know, you've got you've got a great combination of two great cultures. So, you know, you know, you don't need to choose one. You don't need you don't need to identify as just one. You are both. And you're always that. I just remember, you know, some of my friends growing up and trying to find that identity of uh, am I black am I white um but you know uh, from what you know just thinking about when I grew up yeah. um a lot of times our parents would try to shield us from different things yeah so like we wouldn't really know about it until we got older and then when we got older we started to look at it a different way oh okay so you know for 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 my wife and i our our duty is to make sure we try to expose them to everything like uh, this weekend we're driving and and the new drake album had just came out and um uh, we were listening to that uh, on our, we were going to a family friend's house and 
um, you know, there's curse words and things like that. And I want them to be exposed to that sort of thing. I want them to be exposed to that sort of thing. So they know a right way and a wrong way. I don't want the first time that they hear these things come from somebody that is not, uh, you know, not their family or a friend. And uh, I just remember so many times I would be, I would be introduced to things from other people. And I want to make sure that our family, we introduce things and we have conversations about it and not really try to shuffle things under the rug. But um, it's, a, it's just an interesting topic. I don't, you know, there's no right answer. No. There's so many different ways to get, uh, get, get things accomplished, but that's just, I think what we're plan our plan is to do anyway. Yeah. And I think obviously we know uh, from your, what you just shared and also just in general, when you are in athletics, it forces you to sometimes, you know, uh, interact with people outside of your normal maybe interactions or culture you can kind of stay in your small space but as you start to rise through the levels of sport it is going to not only you know uh expose you to a diversity of people or places but also identity you spoke about as you were going through athletics and since this is called the mental advantage podcast when would you say you started to notice the mental aspect of sport as far as, you know, and which sport did it come through? I mean, because if we know it's present in all sports, or I'm sure you know, maybe the, yeah. hopefully the listener does as well, but tell me about when you started to notice it or was it later introduced to you? You know, most of it as a young, as a young player growing up, it's uh, a lot of it is unconscious. Like you'll, you'll try to listen to your headphones right. before a game or something or, you know, I was, I didn't like anybody to talk to me before a game. I like to, I like to chill and, and put some mellow stuff on and, and just be prepared and locked in. So I think it was probably sometime in high school, but it was unconscious. I would do it, continue it in college, but it didn't really become um, uh, apparent till I started coaching where I was like, mm. Oh, you got to get your mind right. Like, and everybody's, everybody's little ritual is going to be different and you have to embrace that as a coach, number one. But as a player, um, I probably didn't recognize it until probably after I was done playing. And, um, and I, th I think that might be true for a lot of people. Cause you just, you don't know what you don't know, but when you start to look back on it, Oh, I was preparing myself. You know, you, you just weren't cognizant of the fact that that was going on. Yeah. But uh, I would say that I probably learned more about it after coaching. And, and even to this day, you know, talking to people like yourself, Bryn, and, and, and so many others in this area, in this field of expertise, it is, um, it is not talked about as much. It was always about push through, fight, you know, uh, grind, uh, keep going. You're not hurt. You're, you know, you're all these things, but you know, your mind is, is the most powerful thing that we have. And, uh, to train your mind in a way to, to optimize your performance. I think if it's done at a younger age, and that's why I'm so happy to be connected with you and the things that you've been doing with your athletes Thank and, you. and, and young kids and college kids and even pros, um, it's just so beneficial because you don't really know how to naturally explain some of these emotions that are going on. And sometimes you need you need a little bit of coaching to help you through some of that stuff. What am, what am I feeling during this? What is there some performance anxiety that I might be having? Um, and I think uh, you know, that, like I said, it's just great that people in your field are doing this and really opening up these conversations for people because uh, it's much needed. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. I mean, we know that mental. I mean not to confuse mental performance with mental health and then even take it as far as mental illness because a lot of people even confuse that. They're like, oh, it's a mental health issue. Yes, but it's also when it's not mental health, it's mental illness. So we're trying to get to the point of the proactive side so we yeah. don't get to the other side, right? But then right. there's also people that have uh, pre-diagnosed things and such like that. So we, we understand the different things. When it comes to your time through sport, and like you said, it is unconscious for a lot of us. I remember when I ran track, all I knew was be fast, be good, do what the coach tells you to do, and hopefully finish in the top, get a medal, whatever the right. case was. When I was out of sport is when I really went in on mindset, and I just wish I knew the stuff I know now right then. Right. When you were in college playing football, uh, did you find, compared to basketball, compared to uh, different sports, do you feel like it takes something different in those sports? Like I said, I think it's similar, but I didn't play football. My brother yeah. did, 
But I'm just curious, like, you know, is football take something different than basketball or, you know, now from the coach's lens, maybe putting that yeah. on and even being in the athlete seat, what do you think? I think they're all different sports, obviously, but I do think there are some commonalities to how you approach everyday life. Um, and, you know, just talking about the journey that I've had, I seen my mom work three jobs from, you know, eight years old all the way through high school, you know, so I saw our, her work ethic. And that more than anything taught me, like, if you want to be if you want to be excellent in something, you have to make sure that you put the time in. If you put the time in, now you're going to be more confident. When that confidence comes, you're going to be able to perform. So at the end of the day, I think if you have the confidence and you're and and I'm not talking about that irrational confidence that a lot of people may have. Right. Some athletes have it, but that that helps them in a lot of aspects. Like even irrational confidence athletes, they perform better than than players that do not have the same confidence they may they may not be as good but right you'll see you'll see a player you know just uh take uh jr smith i would say that he's an irrational confidence type of guy and he, he when he was on those calves he would give them so much energy because he thought he he was he thought he was as good as lebron right you know and, and a lot of times um and that helped their team and that helped him have a long sustainable career over over the time yeah um, and like if you just look at the top athletes it's all about their confidence and a lot of it comes from their preparation if you haven't put in the work there's no way we're going to be confident about it if right and you know if, if you're if if you're in a class and, and you've got a big test that's coming up and you didn't study or you're studying at the last minute, well, you're not going to be very confident when that comes up. <laughs> no. So I think the preparation breeds confidence and the confidence will help your performance. It's not the, it's not the end all be all, but I do think that gives you a little bit more, um, you know, mental fortitude than somebody who isn't as confident or did not put in the work. You can be a great athlete. And I know so many great athletes that, I outperformed or went further than because they were just they they just relied on their their skill set or athleticism or size yeah. or whatever and they stopped working um and so if you continue to put the work in like i always say is try to beat the math however you can beat the math you need to you know all right well so and so's working out this much well how can you do a little bit more so you're ahead of them and you've already caught up to them or surpassed them whenever you yeah. see them next yeah, Kobe once said that it was simple math just to be really at the top of your game. And then you yep. also have the expression talent, ta you know, uh, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work doesn't hard. Work. Yeah. So it, 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 it doesn't matter. Like, you know, there's several people and I know one of the books you recommended to me when we had our pre-conversation when we first were introduced to each other, thanks to Jason Holzer, who's on the 4D Athletes podcast. Uh, yep. You mentioned it takes what it takes. And he mentions Russell Wilson in that book, uh, actually, you know, the quarterback that they initially had who he was going to play behind was more athletically what you want as far as a specimen when it comes to a quarterback in college, yeah. in the professional, but only one played in the Super Bowl. So like you said, it's the, it's not the, it's not, what do they say? It's not the size of the man, but the, <laughs> in the fight, but the fight, <laughs> the size of the fight in the man. So it's, it's having that vision, that, uh, that hunger. And like you said, getting those role models, like your mother and being able to translate that and saying, look, she was, she was like, do or die. This is what I got to do. I have a child to take care of. Got to put food on the table. I don't have another option. And right. I'm sure you felt similarly at times in your sport. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's times where, you know, she was she was down and, and, and things were difficult, but she never made any excuses. And uh, she also had polio when she was young. Mm. So, uh, you know, her her leg is the size of of of, of your wrist. And uh, it's uh, it's just amazing because you see that you like if I'm if I'm struggling or something, I can't I can't I can't, you know, mope and and yeah. be down when somebody has a disability. And so um, she never she never she never even parked in the handicap uh, parking spot. She would always walk. No, I'm good. Mm -hmm. I'm going to walk. Or, you know, even this weekend we were hanging out with her. She has a cane now because she's in her 60s. But, you know, she she walks and it, it looks like it would be hurting all the time. Right. But she, she makes really no excuse. And so, you know, that's that's really the thing is like you have to really train yourself 
to put yourself in those situations of struggle yeah. because the only way that you're going to stretch yourself is okay struggling if you can't if you can't lift this weight well guess what in three three months you might be able to right and so constantly always putting yourself under stress to 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 better yourself and um you know the the athletes that do that over and over and the lot the one other thing that i want to mention is the reinvention of yourself you can't be the same right. you can't do the same thing over and over and you know, if you expect, you're not going to expect the, the the same results over right. and over. You have to really change, um, and so you're going to have to reinvent yourself maybe two, three, four, five, six times. Like, especially for you know yourself once your once your career is over. Yes. Then you got to reinvent yourself again. And so many, so many people because they don't have that mindset. They've only been singular focused for so long it's hard for them to transition. And so that's yeah. why I'm so glad to see athletes pursuing other endeavors earlier, mm. because that is, that, is, that, that is so important. The people who identify things that they're interested in and do those passions like this podcast for you and, and the podcast that I do, yeah. I do it because it's fun. Yeah. Um, and, cool. and, you, and you meet great people like yourself, but that was, that's something new, but it's another interest that you have. And you never know when this interest can actually turn into something bigger than that. So um, I think reinvention of yourself is always the key to long-term success in any field. Yeah. Now, you know, uh, you've transitioned out of sport. So tell me a little bit about that process for you. We know a lot of athletes go through the dark night of the soul. And I want to talk about exactly what you're talking about, this reinvention a yeah. little bit about there's no plan B type stuff. You know what I'm talking about, but we'll get to yeah. that in a moment. I really want to talk about your journey as you transitioned out of sport. Did you have that dark like night of the soul that a lot of people go through? Or did you already know to diversify your identity, sort of reinvert what I call uh, diversify, you call reinventing, uh, yeah. where you had that idea? Um, so I was, I was fortunate enough cause I'm a, I'm a forward thinker. I'm always like trying to, I, I used to play chess a lot when I was younger. Um, and so I'm, you're setting up moves for later on. So mm. for me, I knew, I knew I wanted to, to coach. Uh, I knew I wanted to coach. And so while I was in college, I was working all the basketball camps for the city that we lived in and every summer. So I got some money and got to do something that I enjoyed. Nice. When, we, when we came back for winter breaks, I would go coach at my high school. And so I would be there for that six week period or whatever. And I would be coaching at my high school. Um, and this was basketball at the time. And, uh, and when I was up in college, I went to college up in Oregon during the off season, I would coach middle school teams. Mm -hmm. I would always put myself in situations. And so what you've done is you've created a bunch of different contacts uh, for later on. Mm -hmm. And if you do a good job, you know, people are, are always going to remember that. So that I always tried to make sure I could do the best job I possibly could. I made sure I was like, these kids might have been in seventh grade, but I was coaching them as they were professionals. And mm -hmm. I, I, you know, come in with the practice plan, detailed, all that. So you would, I was preparing for later on. I didn't know what I was actually doing at the time, but I just knew that if I set it up right, you could possibly have something later on. So then as soon as I graduated, I got a coaching job, but I also got a sales job. The sales job allowed me to coach. And as I kind of, um, you know, move my way up the ranks in the company, um, I decided to go back and get my master's degree in education because I knew, look, I love this sales job. It pays me really well, yeah. but I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this for 30, 40 years, even though the money's good. What am I passionate about? Okay. Well, I want to teach and coach kids because I knew that there was like a, a handful of coaches that really made an impact. And then there was coaches that also made a negative impact. And I wanted to make sure that I put a positive impact in these young people's lives because it's so important. It could have went left for me so many times, just yeah. like so many other people. Um, there's so many uh, examples of what could have happened yeah. had this gone, you know, just one, you know, one inch or whatever, you name it. Right. It just could have gone a, a whole, a whole different way. But I always like to set things up for the future just in case. So I got my master's degree, but I didn't even use it until three or four years later, but I already had it just in case. So when the school that I was coaching at now, Valley Christian had a teaching job opening, 
I was ready to come in and take that over as well as the director of basketball and still be able to do some of the the businesses that I wanted to run and, and stuff like that. So I was fortunate to to know what I wanted later on. Mm-hmm. And I've always been the person that says, OK, what do I want to do? And here are the steps. I don't know what the steps are to actually get there, but I'm a reverse engineer it and figure it out from behind. If I figure it out from behind, I just got to find my way over there. But I do know, okay, I want to get to Disneyland. How are we going to get there? There's going to be multiple different ways you can get to drive, you can fly, you can walk, you can ride a bike, however, but we're going to find our way there. I know I need to get these things along the way, but if I can kind of pinpoint some things on this map, all right, check that off, check that off, check this off, get some more experience, boom, 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 boom. And then you put yourself in a good position based on the relationships that you've created over that time. Yeah, absolutely. I, okay, so we talked about, there was a question I want to ask, so I'm going to ask it now, but I still want to come back to the diversity of identity. Yep. The, the big thing that you talked about was good coaches and bad coaches. And I mean, of course, I, I, I'm not painting all coaches with either brush, right? We know that it, it, you, you, know, like you don't know what you don't know. You already said that. All right. When you, being now in the coaching profession, kind of skipping ahead, what's the biggest mistake you feel coaches make? And did you fall prey to this? And what helped you make the shift? I think the biggest mistake now is not uh, not seeking out authentic relationships. You know, I think that is the biggest mistake. Uh, I was definitely a transactional coach early on mm-hmm. in my career. There were times where, you know, I kind of went over the board as far as like what I would say, um, especially when I was younger and and first couple of years in. And it took, you know, a a really close friend of mine to kind of say, hey, that's not you. And I and I kind of changed from there on. I never wanted to be that. Uh, that type of coach, but you're around it. And, you know, a a term they use in Hollywood is playing at somebody. Um, So like if, if uh, Will Smith is the the hot actor, okay, I'm going to pretend like I'm going to start sounding like him so I can potentially get roles and things like that. And that was, that was, that was what I was taught a lot of the times yeah. growing up. And, um, you know, it, I, I fell, I fell victim to it early on. And, uh, I'm, I'm good with saying that I've moved on from that because, and I've learned and I've gotten better. And, um, I just think that is a, a very important piece is creating great relationships with these players. And if you do that, you're willing, you can, you can see more of who they are. They can see more of who you are. And, you know, when, when I was growing up, our coaches, you know, they would coach us and that was pretty much it. That's all um, we knew. Yeah. Yeah. And, but now you got to show them, you know, bring your, bring your family around, bring your, bring your significant other around, um, put, put, put yourself in situations where it's not just about the sport or what they can do for you. You really, mm. you guys are working together and, and, uh, you can get more out of them by creating that really strong foundation. And, uh, that would be the thing I think most coaches are missing these days. They don't remember all these wins and losses. They remember the, the, the how they felt. They remember where they were at. They remember who they were with. Right. Um, they remember those times, those special times that you, that they have with their teammates. And then if a coach really opens up, I think that just opens up so many more opportunities for growth. And we're, we're, we're coaches. We want to help these people live a better life and hopefully if you demonstrate these great qualities they're going to you know help somebody else along the way because of their experiences in your program and i think that for me is going to be the most important part no x's and o's is is strictly relational and and building that foundation yeah i love that because i was going to ask you how do you do that but i think you went into it bringing your you know, the human side of yourself and showing your players the 360 view of yourself, right? Yeah. Showing them all the facets, obviously within professional, uh, in some instances, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I think that's up to the individual what you determine that is. Some people keep themselves sure. quite at bay. Some people don't. So I, I, I always think about, uh, you. are you aware of the love language uh, quiz? Yeah. Uh, yeah, any any married man, probably his wife made him take it. But I'm just stereotyping. I'm stereotyping. 
You know, oh, yeah, I know that one. I know it. Yeah. <laughs> so what is your uh, love language? I'm just asking. Uh, your number one. Do you know? Uh, I would say respect would be would be okay. my. That's not one of the ones on the love language quiz, though. Right, but I'm just for for me personally. For you, you like respect, okay? Is is, is respect in yeah. uh, in that? What is yours? Uh, mine is uh, words of affirmation. So I, I need validation. Wife. I need to hear. My, my right, wife, that's my wife's. She's she's affirmation, positive affirmation. Yes, for sure. I need to hear you're doing a good job, even if you're going to give me some some vinegar. I need some sugar first, right? You know, I need to know like, okay, you're doing a great job, and here's some places you can improve. I believe. Uh, you know, that that would go a long way if players, if coaches also paid attention to not necessarily doing the love language test, but that sort of assessment of how does my player need to be communicated with? I think in the old days, it was kind of like, it's my team, you fit in. And I know with some of these successful programs, when you're going to Alabama, you're going to Michigan, you're going to Oregon, or, you know, when we're talking football, basketball, obviously Duke, Kentucky, all these great dynasty programs, it kind of is this sense of, uh, this feeling of, well, I'm playing for coach K, for example, I know he's, he's, um, retiring, but it, it becomes this whole idea of like, oh my gosh, like I've got to get in where I fit in. But I think why these guys have been successful so many times and women in on the Tennessee side and such in some instances is that they took the time to make the adjustment, to build those relationships and learn the language of their player to translate what they wanted. What do you think about that? Um, and how much of that do you feel like you're doing now? Or is that something, you know, you could still improve on? Yeah. Well, if you think about all of the the great coaches, just think about Giannis uh, for, for a quick second and him and coach Bud have a really great relationship. Yeah. Everybody was talking about how he was going to get fired at the end of the year if they didn't win. And, you know, him and Giannis embracing and Chris Middleton, they're all – we saw that. We saw that bond that they had. These three are in a, in a huddle right after a championship celebrating – their accomplishment that they that they were able to finally finally attain yeah um, that right there says a whole lot about who he is and the the types of bonds that he has he has brought in with his players yeah um, you know Greg Popovich the same way he'll often have dinners with them and and wine and things like that you know Brad Stevens is very similar Pat Riley is a yeah. family family oriented from, from the top down in Miami Heat culture that's built in it's ingrained and then you look at let's say uh the patriots for instance and bill belichick is a fabulous coach like probably the best football coach that has ever lived but tom brady don't fool with them right now you know you know what i mean right like, he's, not, he's not fooling with them and he said he's had more fun with tampa bay than ever before and he's only been with them for one year this is gonna obviously gonna be a second year. yeah when but, when uh just sorry to interject but i want to i want to point that out when you were talking about great coaches because one thing i noticed about tom as well as the coach of tampa bay crediting the team in their win right like and he went over his coaching staff the coach did so I thought that was a great way to show like, you know, that humility versus like, yeah, you know, it's all about me. So. Oh yeah. And I, I heard this from somebody that came on my podcast and I, I just stole in it now, but there's two types of individuals. There's two types of coaches. There's two types of parent, you name it. The ones that are humble and the ones that are going to be humbled. And uh, mm. that, that for me is, uh, has always like remained in my head ever since that conversation because it's so true you know you can and it goes back to the the power um of remaining neutral in a lot of situations you know um bill belichick as good as a coach as he is he doesn't not and from what they say right. doesn't have the same type of rapport and i don't know him he, he might have great relationships with certain but they 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 don't get a chance to be themselves a whole lot of times. You know, it's the Patriot way. You're doing, gonna do it this way. You're gonna do this. Yeah, we're gonna win. But at the same time, you don't have the you don't have the same opportunities as somebody like Pete Carroll, for instance. Pete Carroll is one of the 
uh, most winningest coaches, and he is a he is definitely a multi dimensional coach Absolutely. as far as creating those relationships. And you know, he took it right on the chin when he he said it was my it was my my duty to call that pass play, not not Russ's. It wasn't the it wasn't the offensive coordinators. You put that on me, and uh, he had to he had to live with that for a long time. And I've I've, I've read most of his books and stuff like that, but it's uh it's hard to be 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 that person that's willing to but that's what leadership is. Yeah. You know, the leader leader has to, you know, go out in front when it gets bad or stay behind when it gets bad. And you, you have to be the one to uh, take onus for it. And I think, um, I don't even know if we answered your original question, but um, I just think that leadership in that, in that capacity is extremely vital for successful yeah. organizations. Um, so, yeah. Well, it was just about, uh, learning the language of the player, right? Oh, so yeah, like yeah. knowing how to get the most out of a Tom Brady, right? So to hear Tom Brady doesn't want to talk to Belichick, it kind of gets like, well, that's interesting because you won all these rings with him. But for whatever reason, Tom's like, yeah, I don't want to play there anymore. I don't feel yeah. like that's home for me. And so that is a, a an interesting paradox. So the so to answer your question, what do I do? So like yeah. we'll get, we'll get the team together, and I'll take them out in fours. They can pick anywhere they want in the preseason. We go we go have lunch or dinner or whatever, nice. and uh, we don't talk we don't talk about basketball. We talk about how's their school going, uh, this that and the third. How's the family? You know what are you what are you interested in um, moving forward and stuff like that. You learn so much more about the the players. You yeah. know you find out okay a couple. Couple of them have uh, have basically you know, their stepfathers are their dads. They don't know who their dad is. Oh well, I you know my dad was in my life too, but he hasn't been there. My mom raised me, right. so and so. So you 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 get to touch on so many different things that you never would have found out. Like I found out so many so many fun facts about the players when you do this. And um, I learned this from one of my former AAU coaches, like, and I, I went and coached with him. Um, I was his JV coach for a number of years mm -hmm. while he was, and I, I watched him do this and his players really fool with him every single year. Like they would say, it didn't matter what type of coach he was, whether he knew what he was doing or not, yeah. they rocked with him. And that, that showed me, it's like, Hey, you got to make sure that regardless, this is going to go by quick. And so at the end of the day, I want these, these kids to invite me to their wedding or let me know when they're having children or stuff like that. That's way more important, way more important than, um, you know, if we win these games or not. And yeah, yeah. Like winning is, winning is for sure important. It definitely is important. Um, but creating these and cultivating these relationships, in my opinion, is way more important than any of the wins and losses. I love that when you said, right, like they don't remember the wins and losses because I couldn't tell you, right, exactly what happened. I mean, I know how we finished in high school. I know certain things, but I don't remember each individual meet or race or anything like that. But I do remember the fun days on the, on the track, right, having difficult workouts. All I remember, my memories are all about my experiences with my teammates and my coaches, not about the specific individual races or meets or anything like that for track. Basketball only lasted two years, so I don't have much other than, unfortunately, bad coach stories. But uh, <laughs> those are, um, but, but it was, it's, it's an interesting thing. So when we go back to that, when you talk about talking to them other than basketball, which I talked about this on a previous podcast about the mental health of your athlete and how we generally start to pigeonhole these people, even if they don't want to be pigeonholed, we start to pigeonhole them. I had a coach that I spoke to, I think she coaches volleyball at Arizona, and she was saying that even before like she would go places and people would introduce her as like this volleyball player. And she was like, well, can you just let me like, let me mention it. Like, don't make me the volleyball player at the party or, you know, like, right. oh, she's like the, the top basketball or, you know, top prospect. She was like, uh, I don't, the people don't let you get out of that identity. So what do you, when you talk about, uh, and obviously it's helpful to talk to athletes about other than their sport, like you said, I'm interested in you as a person, not just basketball. However, sometimes the athlete only wants to talk about basketball or only wants to. So what's your advice for helping the athlete shift the focus uh, oh, you know, to diversify? I call it diversify identity because they, a lot of athletes perceive plan B as like, yeah. oh, you're just saying if I don't make it. So I like to call it 
a multi-phase plan, right? It's like, okay, basketball is one of your main facets of that plan. And also you are interested in podcasting, like we talked about. You're interested right. in whatever. So how do we help the athlete shift that focus and uh, be able to have a multi-phase plan so they don't feel like it's a fallback plan? Yeah. So I think one of the questions, or one of the questions you would give the athletes is present them. Um, give me five things you're interested in. Oh, I like sneakers. I like art. I like, um, I'm very good at math, blah, blah, blah. And then you, you know, you can have conversations on each one of those things. So mm. tell me about mathematics. Like I haven't done the last math class I did was statistics, but these kids are taking statistics as sophomores now, um, in high school at the school that we're at. So, you know, you can, you can just start bridging the gap between those sort of things um and you could really share share your experiences too you know talk about when you're in high school and oh this happened or my coach did this or whatever um and then just you know you can you, you just be just be vulnerable with them and i'll also ask them like uh when the seniors are done we'll have a we'll have like a senior dinner and we'll we'll go to dinner or they'll come over mm -hmm. to the house and we'll just sit and we'll we'll talk and I'll ask them specific stuff like um, if 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 there was something different that I could do personally as a coach, what would it be? So now you're learning about like th this is this is direct criticism, right? It's uh, it's it's but it's beneficial. You need criticism right. to, to kind of grow. And what better criticism than right from your players? Mm -hmm. um, so one of the years I learned that coach you're too open and honest with us they said that uh, and, and the, like we know really? about the, we we know about the playing time we know who's going to play and who's not you don't need to let us know because I, I i want them to understand that it's not it's not a personal thing i'm just trying to do what's right. best for the team and um you know so that in that particular year they felt like we talked about it too much um, but in other years, maybe they thought, and that, like you said, the love languages, everybody's yeah. going to be different. <laughs> exactly. like, um, so our, our point guard at that time, she was a very, like a dominant personality. So you could tell her whatever she, it don't matter. Yeah. Like so to her, it's like, come on, I, we got it. I'm going to be fine yeah. anyway. But, uh, for everybody else, it may not have been that way. So it's, it's, it's just really getting to know who they are and, um, letting, letting kids be who they are too. And, mm. uh, with like no expectations, just let them, let them be who they are. If they're silly, let them be silly. Understand that you have to, you, it's, it's not, their duty to just to comply with what we want right we have to meet them too you know um so i think to to answer your question ways to get them out is number one just be vulnerable and op be, be open to share with them yeah. and ask open-ended questions that they actually have to respond to not yes or no right or like oh so what, what really interests you about uh, art Tell, uh, have you done yeah. any recent art blah 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 and then they they might get ignited by a subject like that because you're genuinely curious like that's a great thing too like i can tell your curiosity and when we switch roles you'll you'll be able to see mine yeah I'm genuinely curious to understand the way you think about something and what something that you say is going to resonate with me and i'm going to take that and i'm going to run with it oh that's a good one just like the person i can't remember who it was i said you're either you, you're either humble they're going to get humbled mm -hmm. i remember that i've added that to my arsenal and now it's just a part of me because that fits with what wh who i am and um maybe you find something that fits it's like a puzzle with some of these players it may not fit that way but if you meet them this way um one of the young ladies that i had as a life coach that, that came on um uh, kendra aaron i do remember her name okay um she and you should have her on okay. she's great too she's she's on the same same wavelength as well but awesome. she she told me um you know how she how she comes in if she sees a player that's not in a good mood um walking in the door she's like what do you what is your what is your mood choice today or how do you how are you going to attack this mm. day continue with the way you walked in or you can change that it's up to you to change it but i'm going to be the same person i'm here i'm ready to work you just you show who you're going to be today uh it's your choice and uh I, that that has stuck with me as well so each one of these things yeah. it's almost like a selfish thing to be honest brand because 
you know. Agreed. <laughs> every, every time I every time I jump on and have one of these long form conversations, I'm taking stuff from the other people, and it may not be the same way, but you you may change the way I look at it and be like, oh, okay, cool, I can use that, and hopefully we can share that with somebody else, yeah. and then they they're able to see, and that you know that's just going to be the continual continuous circle of life, um, yeah. and yeah, it, 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 a lot of it is a selfish thing because you're going to get more out of the situation than yeah. not. Like if you're, if you're just a curious person naturally and ask a lot of questions, yeah. well, people, lo people love to talk, talk about themselves in particular <laughs> too. So it's okay for you to kind of put somebody right. else on that pedestal um, and tell them, man, there's some great things you're doing because Sometimes you're your only cheerleader and to hear it, like you talked about, you know, positive affirmations, yeah. it, it feels good when somebody, when somebody thinks you're doing a good job and yeah. it gives you strength to, to continue. So. Yes. Those dopamine hits, right? Like, um, I love what you said. First of all, yes, absolutely. Positivity feeds. And we're going to talk about positivity in just a moment because I have some issues with Trevor's book. I'm just going to tell you right now. I've, I'm almost done with it. I've got about, so I'm, I'm curious to see what you're, if you had any critiques about his book. However, uh, when what I love about what struck me when you were talking was this idea of coaching the team you have, not just coaching the sport. So in other words, at recognizing that, look, this is what I have. These are, you know, the, here's, here's the sport we're playing and here's the, the arsenal of resources that I am employing at this time. So meeting them where they're at and finding ways. And I love the open-ended questions. It's so important because it's easy to ask yes or no questions. And that's almost like your way of uh, hearing what you want to hear. If they, you know, that's called it leading the witness, right? <laughs> like we're going to work hard, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. right? But when you ask a player, like what's important to you, about while we're playing basketball, you're gonna get a very much more rich, nuanced answer than a yes, no. So I think that's awesome. And I love, uh, what's her name, Kendra? Yep, Kendra. Okay. Kendra talking about, yeah, what mood are, wh wh where are we at? Like, you know, even if you do it on a scale from one to 10, what's your mood? And then what you do next is gonna determine who you do decide to be today. So that's fabulous. Yeah. When it comes to neutral thinking, you mentioned it. I do talk to my athletes about the 90-10 rule. Life is 10% what happens to you, 90% how you respond to it. I do believe yeah. everything is neutral in the regard of we have a game, there is a result, and how I perceive that game sort of charges it positively or negatively. My criticism of Trevor is calling it neutral thinking but it really is looking at things that are neutral and then still putting them in the positive versus negative category. Cause he does speak pretty extensively about negative thinking. And I right. think positivity gets a, a bad rap. I'm interested to see what are your thoughts about that? Because I'm like, you know, saying I'm going to go to the Super Bowl to me is not a neutral thought. That's a positive thought. Right. You know, now he's talking about pie in the spot, sky saying it, but it's like, if I execute my game plan, I'll end up at the Super Bowl. But that's still, to me, positive thinking. What do you think about that? Sure. I think uh, it's interesting because his dad was was the positive think guy. Yes. Right? So um, I think just in general, as kids, you kind of want to do things a little bit different than yeah. your parents. And it may be it may be the same language. Uh, just a slightly different dialect uh, yes. of it, and so I think uh, what he was saying is, yeah, you're you're not wrong. It's and it's every and it's how you digest it, right? right. So I think um, there's a lot of positivity in what he was saying. You can't yes. be as yes. successful as he is or any of the athletes that he has without positively right hoping hoping for these outcomes and and doing all the steps necessary that it actually makes sense in the long run that, that you can actually accomplish these things i think uh i think the neutral thing is more of a mindset like i gotta remain neutral i yes. can't get too high or too low yeah. and so um i think that for me when when i read that like yeah all the mostly all the stuff that he was talking about is positive yeah. but um i just think he tried to try to just sway away from what his dad right. was, what his dad was, what his, what his dad would be doing. Yeah. Um, and just kind of make chronic, trying to create your own lane, you know? Yeah. Um, Absolutely. But 
So, yeah, I, I don't disagree with, with you or him. I just think it's the perspective. And it's just like uh, it's just like certain foods that you eat. Some foods I might like, but others you might not like or right. whichever might not like. And so you right. eat what you, you, you digest this, however it works for you yes. best. And so I, I'm taking only the things that I need from that book. Absolutely. Um, and, and you might take something different and, you know, Jason might take something different, but we're all taking something from it, from those different thoughts, because it's just a, way, a different way to look at something. Um, Absolutely. You know, my undergrad is in psychology. So you talk about Piaget's theory where you're looking at something from this direction and then you come around and you look at it from <laughs> exactly. this pers perspective and now it's completely different. And then you zoom out and then you can see the whole 360 view of what it is. Right. And so, you know, everything, everything's about your perspective. And what I like is you can choose what your perspective is going to be. And yeah. more importantly, just like our, just like our uh, attire we're wearing today, we can also change that. Right. We can change our perspective as soon as the facts change too. So who knows, in 10 years, we might talk about how negative, negative thinking is going. I don't know how negative thinking yeah, would be. I like, I'd love to good. see that one. <laughs> but I'm sure there's some people out there that are coming up with different theories and it may have, oh, that does actually make sense. Yeah. But, you, know, you can, you can, you can make a lot of things come to light if you just tweak it just a little bit. And I think for, um, for Trevor, that was his little thing. Yeah. I'm going to be a little bit different than my father. And this is how I think, yeah. not necessarily how my dad thinks. So. No, absolutely. And I want to, for those of you listening or watching uh, on YouTube, and listening on Apple or Stitcher or wherever you're consuming this podcast, I want to make sure you know the book because it is really good. It's Trevor Moad, M-O-W-A-D, I think. I think that's mm -hmm. correct. And he is like a top performance specialist. I'm going to say, you know, uh, I don't believe he's a psychologist, but he uh, has worked with IMG Academy and that springboarded him into working with some of the top names in sports, Nick Saban. Uh, you know, Bill Belichick, uh, you know, I mean, I don't even know if, anyway, he's worked with lots of people in football. Russell Wilson is like his main client, but he has so many top names that he's gotten the privilege to work with in basketball and, uh, football in particular, yeah. as well as other sports soccer with the U S Olympic, uh, the U S soccer team, excuse me, the under 17s, I think. So it's, it's good to hear his perspective because it's called It Takes What It Takes. So if I didn't say that, that's the name of the book. Go grab it. Uh, I lis I'm listening to it on audiobook because I'm also part of a book club where I have to read a certain amount of pages a night. So I can't add uh, currently Trevor's book to the... Um, so when I'm in the car, I'm just listening to it. But thank you for that recommendation. Uh, and, been, and I want to and I want to oh, mention uh, the relationship that he created with Russell. Oh, I know. Yeah. That's the reason why this whole thing works. Yeah, because it's an authentic relationship. I believe they're best friends, and I yep. believe he was Rus he was in Russell's wedding, um, oh, nice. and and Trevor uh, was going through um, his relationship struggles and stuff like that, and he was vulnerable with Russell, and so they've 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 got a bond that is not j not just beyond, not just client, yeah, uh, you know, and guru. Right. It is a complete friendship with um, just the full amount of trust in one another. And they, they care about each other beyond Absolutely. whatever it is they do. And I think that is also kind of what we've been talking about, too, is just creating authentic, real relationships. And you see what happens when you are able to put these things together in that context. You can really do great things once you're in relation with people. Yes, absolutely. Uh, what I liked about his book uh, was it was reaffirming for me because I teach literally almost everything he's talking about and I haven't had quite the breadth of the um, clientele that he has had. So it was very like, oh, basically, yes, this is great. Fabulous. I'm, you know, so I I'm, I'm, thank you for bringing that book into my life. It has been great. I want to get back to you as a coach because we're not here to talk about Trevor. If we have him on the podcast, we will talk about him. Uh, and I am going to reach out to him because I really do want to have a conversation with him. You are a coach and you coach both men and women or women? Uh, yes, both. Um, so I, I currently coach uh, varsity girls 
at Valley Christian High School. Okay. But I also have a club t- club program called Top Flight Elite, and okay. we have boys and girls fourth through uh, high school. And um, so I've I've coached boys, and like my first, this is what my 18th, 19th year coaching. My first like eight years, I I was coaching only boys. Then I started coaching girls, and then sometimes I do boys yeah. for club, and, and then high school I still do girls. So. All right. So knowing that you have both genders and top level athletes, what do you find is the biggest difference between a male and a female athlete, if at all, uh, when it comes to mindset? Is there anything different? Yeah, uh, uh, I would say there is a difference. Um, The biggest thing is, is how you challenge them. Um, as far as coaching is concerned, but I'll get to like the differences I see in gender, but, uh, challenging them, you can challenge a boy, uh, or a young man in a different way than you can challenge a girl. Now the challenges are still the same, but you're going to have to, you're you're basically going to have to, uh, find the language that works best Mm -hmm. for, for that gender. Um, the game, in my opinion, is still the same, um, the dimensions are still the same. The athleticism is, is probably a little bit more pronounced on the boys' side, yeah. but the girls are, are darn near catching up. The girls are probably a little bit more analytical and listen better, probably execute better. Um, and I think overall, being being a coach of both, they listen more. They're more receptive mm. to understanding how they can benefit from doing it a certain way. And coaching is is in the simplest terms is ch- uh, changing behavior. So you want to change behavior to the positive outcome and you're going to have to, you're going to have to do these certain steps in order to get that positive outcome. Boys might be a little bit less receptive because they think they can do it their way. But, um, you know, uh, a lot of it is the same, but I would just say the approach on which you challenge them is going to be a little bit different from a, from a male to a female. Um, and uh, I do think that boys do crave relationships, relation with the coaches more than they would let on. And I do think, you know, uh, as, a, as a male coach or a female coach, you need to, to, to make sure those relationships are validated with yeah. dealing with dealing with the young ladies. Um, but I, I thoroughly enjoy both. There's, there's great, there's great kids on both sides. There's terrible kids on both sides as far as attitudes go. Yes. You know? Yes. Um, yes. So that, that, that just happened just like in our society, there's a lot of great people, but there's also a lot of crappy people too. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I, I really, I really enjoy pouring into, to young people, no matter what the, the, the gender or age is. And if you can just be a positive influence on their life in, in, in any direction, like the great athletes are usually going to be great. They'll find a way out to be great. Okay. Yeah. But can you impact them beyond just the sport? And that is the most again, the most important part of it. Now, don't get me wrong, because if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, he doesn't care about, no, 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 no. The X's and O's and the 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 discipline and the all of that. Fundamentals, right. The yeah. fundamentals, it's all a part of it, but you you can't lose the, the 360 foot de, uh, degree angle on what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Why do we get into what we're getting into? Why do you do what you're trying to do? Is Is to help people exactly figure out whatever it is and there's people that you probably reach out to there's people that i reach out to that are mentors of mine that i'll reach out if i got questions hey i'm kind of going through this you got any advice and they'll give you your best and they'll try to help you through it so we're all trying to figure this thing out every single day and um i think that it doesn't really matter what gender you're coaching you just have to understand the approach necessary for that particular person or individual yeah, I think I think absolutely exactly. There's no one size fits all for either gender, so don't put them in boxes, right? Oh, this is a girls team, they feel this way. This is a boys team. Again, coach the team that you have and the players that you have. So coming back to that, that's fabulous. And thanks for saying women are better listeners. We already knew it, but now you heard it here, folks. Uh anyway, so <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Um, all right. Now we're talking about, uh, one of the things that I wanted to come uh, back to was when you're coaching, 
What do you feel like today's athlete is the hardest thing they're facing, they're facing, right? There's a lot of talk about extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation, but given that you've seen uh, over your career, you said 17 years of coaching, you you said 17, right? I'm not making that up, right? All of a sudden yeah, I'm saying, yeah. did he say 11? All right, I don't know why that just came to me. I want to make sure. 17 years of coaching. What do you feel like is, has it changed what athletes are facing or what do you feel has been the common thread that athletes are facing that, you know, they have to overcome to be great yeah. or to be competitive or whatever? I think the main thing is just all the, uh, the external hype of whether it be a, a you know, 15 second, uh, Instagram reel or a minute TikTok or whatever it is, always trying to be in the limelight and uh, all that stuff looks good. It's it's the best version of whatever it is that they're doing. Yeah. You're not seeing all of, you're only seeing the positive things. And I think we need to see more of the negative things. I think the kids need to see that because they look at so-and-so, oh, they're doing this, they're doing that. And so they're always in constant comparison with whatever else is going on out there in the world. Um, and in their circles, you know, they have so many more friends, friends, but right. a lot of times they've never even really met these people. They've, you know, they've just, they're friends on social media. Right. And, um, I think that would be the biggest thing is, is the biggest hurdle. Like, you know, we'll, we'll see the team and they're on their Instagrams and they're commenting on so-and-so's picture and, and that, oh, did you see this? Did you see that? And it's like, people need to understand that they should, they shouldn't worry too much about what everybody else is doing. Cause really nobody's concerned with what they're doing either. You know, um, you know, right. We're all, we're all the, we're all the superstar in our own action movie. Right. And so if somebody says something or they posted this and you, you're trying to catch up to that, like, I just think that is the biggest thing for them to try to overcome these days is just uh, the sense of their own self-worth and not putting it all in what everybody else thinks outside because there's probably only a, a, a small percentage of people that you actually know that really care about you right. if, if you're going through something. And so I think if that small, small group looks at you in a certain way, then that's what you should, that's what is like, if they look down upon you or, um, or they're supporting it, those are the ones that really matter. It doesn't really matter if all those other people that don't know you support right. you or don't support you. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing. It's just the external yeah. social factors that go into t today's life where everything is examined and over-examined and then yeah. that can kind of, that can kind of get into your own thoughts. How do you as a coach or a leader that might be listening to this that is charged with, you know, youth or even people, how do you believe a coach or a leader can help with that? Because I've been told in some instances, you got players that have their phones out at halftime. Like, <laughs> and so walking into the locker room, I couldn't even imagine having, I mean, you know, having a phone. I know some of us didn't grow up in a time where we would have a cell phone. But, you know, having a phone out or, you know, just being casual during a time that my coach was talking to me, for example. Yeah, again, um, you know, you have to adapt to mm. you have to adapt to the times. It is a, like a, a lot of the NBA players, uh, they'll pull their phones out at halftime. And I've heard coaches on different podcasts discuss um, why they either allow it or they don't. You know, but if we if we put a hard stance down and we put a we put a line in the sand and we say, okay, you don't have you don't have your phones in the locker rooms. Well, what's going to happen when that player pulls it out? You got to be willing to to react. So instead of like uh, placing non negotiables, I would say um, I would say something like, hey, we're not going to have our phones during halftime. Anytime yeah. else you want, any, any other time you want to have your phone, cool, whatever. Right. Uh, but we're not going to just have them in the locker room or we will allow it if this is the case, Got you it. know, stuff like that. So I think you, you have to meet them not mm -hmm. halfway, but you have to definitely like think, no, well, what, what is really important? Is this, does this impact winning? 
Right. Um, and if it does impact winning, then, you know, maybe you, you draw a line in the sand, but I think the looser you can be and let that and let them be the ones that are, are the police of it. Cause you don't want to have to police everything too. Hey, you're in charge of it. anybody has a phone. And if like a team captain, somebody pulls their phone out, you decide what's going to happen. And so you put it back on them and you give them ownership of the team. Cause at the end of the day, the teams are going to, the teams are the ones that are playing, you know, we're just kind of the directors and yeah. Uh, however, however they're going to improv out there on the court, like we can, we can say this is how the game is going to go, and it's going to go a completely different way. It's up right. to them. So the same thing there. Like, um, I don't, I don't address the phone thing, and like they just know. Okay, if I'm talking, make sure your phone's not out, stuff like that. But gotcha. um, if if you ask me in '04 when I first started coaching, absolutely no phones, blah blah blah, all that stuff. Right. But, you got to grow and learn with the times. And if you don't, you'll get left behind. Mm. Uh, and I, I would rather, I would rather them, I would rather them execute what we're saying. If, if having, is having their phone out going to let them execute better or worse? I don't really know. So should we be worrying about something that is so mm. insignificant? I don't know. Um, but in that case, if they did have their phone, Hey, let's just not have the phones out and I keep it at that. I wouldn't say yeah. anything more than that. Let's not have the phones during halftime. Y'all want to have them before or after? Cool. But this is how we're going to rock with it. And yeah. just don't put any, uh, you know, full demands because then they're going to, then, then you're going to see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then you're going to see, all right, well, <clears throat> what are you going to do coach? Cause somebody will just do it just because it's like, really? And, and, and you know, you gotta, you kind of gotta like, in my opinion, Make it like a joke. Really, you gonna pull the phone out right now? Yeah. You know, just, come on now. After the put it, put it. Yeah, put please, it up now please tell me what's going on on that Netflix series uh, yeah. right after I get done with this halftime speech. <laughs> yeah. Oh, or or I'll say something like this: Where, um, <clears throat> hey, I just want to make sure you're okay. Is your family, everybody, okay? They're they're good. Okay, got it. Um, so just put your phone away, and then if it's not, just let me know, and you can go out and take a call yeah. or something. So just something like that, where you kind of defuse the situation, I think is a, is a, is a real, is a trick that I've learned uh, more recently. Yeah, no, I love that being flexible, adaptable. And like you said, meeting them where we're at, which seems to be the theme that we're going down here, right? We got to meet them where we're at. And, it, and as you said, is it going to affect the outcome we're trying to produce or a better performance on the court or on the field or whatever sport it is? And if not, then we need to pick our battles, just like everything in relationships, since we talked a lot about the richness of relationship and coaching being one of those paramount things to getting better performance, we're going to yeah. have to pick our battles in order to get that. And I think also just like, you know, like I was thinking of even like a culture where you're just like, hey, listen, some teams do this, some teams do that. You decide, right? You tell me. But if you can tell me that you, you know, I mean, it's been proven that multitasking doesn't work. So if you can have your phone, you know, silenced in a way while we're talking and then, like you said, after or something like that, then, you know, I'm not going to make a big deal out of it, but I can't tell. So I'm, a, I'm just going to, I'm going to leave it to you to make your decisions. Right. So I, I like that too, like having their choice versus it being like, this is my decision. So, and I love the check-in as well. Are they okay? Right. So we're getting close to the time of wrapping this interview up. So I want to ask you a, a few other questions. One what is uh, the biggest tip that you have found to drive intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation? Because we have talked a lot about like, there was a, a question about the pep talk, right? How powerful is the pep talk necessary because it feels great, but does it sustain for the full 60 minute game or whatever the case is? So what do you think on athletes, how to, as a coach, motivating athletes on an extrinsic or intrinsic level or how do you distinguish maybe driving? I think, on, I think on an intrinsic level is uh, seeing it more often. So like if, if you, if, if I'm a coach, I'm going to tell my player, Hey, I want you to write on your bedroom door. Every time you leave, I'm the best player in the state. And you just write that or, or you see it every single day. So I think if you start to, to see things and then you start to believe it. And once mm -hmm. you really start to believe it, that's when you can kind of take off. So I would say um, be your own, be your own best cheerleader. Tell yourself a, a lot of different positive things in uh, in relation to whatever it is and, yeah. and 
really, really pump yourself up a lot of the times. Man, say, I'm great today. Yeah. I was awesome today. You know, uh, a lot of times we just, we, we focus on, oh man, I didn't do this. I didn't do this. Right. But what did you, what did you do? Um, so for me, I think that would be the most important part is like, it, it, whether it be positive self-talk or just being able to see it or, you know, write, write little affirmations to yourself and kind of post them wherever around the house or your bathroom or room and you just start to see them and and then hopefully that just changes your whole mentality on you're seeing things as more good rather than more negative um and that would be that would be something i think about as far as intrinsically motivating athletes um, for their performance okay now you are uh what was i thinking um oh we talk a lot about the 90 10 rule. We already said it on this podcast, but everybody in sport, unless you're, I think it's Vince Lombardi that said it, it's like sports is 90, you know, 10%, whatever he said, physical, and then the other percentage is mental or whatever it is. But everybody knows it's the 90 10 rule, right? How much practice time, because this has been my big pet peeve, hardly anyone devotes actual practice time to the mental game. We spend 99.9% of our time on the physical game and we kind of expect the athlete to get out of their own head, figure it out. Like you said, the old school days. Now you talk a lot about relationship. You talk a lot about what you prioritize to help the athlete to, to know what's important. Do you devote practice time to the mental game and how have you seen that pay off? Yeah, so uh, two years ago, not last year during uh, COVID, but right. two years ago, we had a... Uh, uh, a mental performance coach on our staff. So he would nice. come to most, most practices. He, we would, you know, kind of plan out the week. His name is Shay Coleman. You should probably have him on. He's getting his doctorate in the, okay. uh, this sort of thing right now, but really good dude. And so, you know, Hey coach, can I have 15 minutes before or after practice? Oh yeah, you got it. So we'd incorporate him into nice. the practice plan or we would do it after practice and uh it worked out really well you know and Good. and the team the team was closer they were able to um you know transition easier from task to task because now they're thinking and being uh, more thoughtful about how, what they say how they nice. do you know that sort of thing so it worked really well for us we're going to be using the 4d athletes program with our with our team this year nice. and you're right like it's um is something that I think needs to be more, but then you do as a coach, you got this pull where it's like, Oh, we need to do yeah. offense. We got defense. We got to do, uh, you know, a side out of bounds, base on out of bounds, press, press break. There's so many things that you're trying to do with the limited amount of time. You're just never going to be able to get to. But I think if you can, you know, take 10 minutes a, a day out of the practice, say, this is what we are going to dedicate to this getting back to Kobe is changing the math. Well, 10 minutes a day multiplied by however long our exactly. season is, you're going to see, uh, you know, however many hours that turns into be, if that was worth your team, you know, getting closer as far as bonding, whether that be having them communicate better, uh, obviously, hopefully affecting their play in a positive way, um, getting more relational with one another or the coach, that is worth it in my opinion and truth be told i would i i need to make sure we do more of it yeah um if we're if we're really trying to do it the right way it has to be even more but um i do think it is important um i don't really know what percentage you would put on it it's just yeah it's, invalu it's invaluable in my and it's like marketing too you don't really know if it's really working unless until it until your business is selling a lot of product right exactly. you just don't know um, right. like, yeah, that did that, did that new Apple commercial with the, you know, cool new music, get me to buy their product. I don't know. I right. mean, they don't know either, but they're keep pumping them out. Right. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to quantify because you can't quantify it, but I do know the way it feels. And I do think it makes you feel better as a group when you take the time to implement yeah. some of the things that you're talking about. Well, I, I obviously, yeah, it is hard to draw it back, right? Because you know, if I'm teaching you the press break, and then I see you execute the press break, how well did I, you know, get the what's necessary in that play, so I can see it play out right before my eyes. 
what I can see is the intangibles. However, if I have, which is something that I do with my athletes, take some sort of barometer of where they're at at the beginning and then look at where they're at after. And then of course, obviously, um, although all stats can't measure everything because somebody can have a great game and not really rank on the stat sheet or the balance sheet sometimes, uh, because they can be, you know, the off the ball things. But I think it's really great to have that, to give athletes the opportunity to see, like you said, the closer bonding you're going to get a, I, I always say, if you don't tap into a player's mental game, you're leaving performance on the table. There's some potential mm-hmm. that you're not tapping into. So I think it's, it's, it's important. So I'm happy to hear that you guys had a mental performance coach, uh, and also that you're uh, going forward with more of it. And like you said, yeah, can I do more? And it's like, well, if I could sacrifice a certain amount of time to see it pay off, yeah, it is a risk. But, you know, I think nine times out of 10, it's going to pay off in the way that you want it to. Um, but that's Absolutely. hard. It's hard. It, it takes also a lot of, um, have you seen Ted Lasso? No, I haven't. I've, I've been hearing a lot of good stuff about it, though, actually. <laughs> I just watched it because it literally like four or five people that were coming on my podcast mentioned it, but there's a particular episode where a sports psychologist is brought in and he's having a hard time because he's always been like the, you know, the one that kind of motivates the players and does the thing. Um, mm-hmm. And so it does take a certain type of humility on the part of the coach too to let allow that outside voice to come in because it, it can be scary for that coach as well. And I think also someone like myself has to have that in mind, but know that like through collaboration is where, you know, the most creative genius happens. And so together we can get the most out of our athletes, then it's a win-win for everybody. Oh, I agree with you 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, last question. And then we're gonna go into the rapid fire questions, okay? Okay. What is your mental advantage? Um, it's a good question. I just think, uh, like I mentioned earlier before, watching my mom go through all the things that she went through, uh, raising me, that is, that has created a mental advantage that I think is, I wouldn't say unmatched because there's other people that have the same type of like drive and, and, uh, and stuff like that. But I just think when hard things come in my life, I'm e- it's easier for me to kind of get over them and accomplish them and understand that, like, <clears throat> I may fail a lot, but yeah. I don't need – all I need to have is a few wins or win more than I lose. And and usually that is the case. I don't yeah. win. I don't win in life every single day. I don't win as a parent every single day. I don't win as a coach every single day or as a teacher or a business owner. Right. But – I win more than I lose. And that has been, been something that I've always taken. I don't need to win every, every, every time. Like, you know, my son right now is almost four years old. If he doesn't win, I'm not letting him beat me. First of all, like if he's going to beat me, he's just going to beat me. He's going to have to earn it. (laughs) Yes, exactly. So he gets upset every time he doesn't make it one of his shots or, you know, can't hit this or can't figure out this puzzle. He gets frustrated. And I'm, and, and I, I want him to feel that frustration. Honestly, yeah. I want him to be able to get over that in a way that you're just able to cope better. I want him to go yeah. through really difficult things. Um, uh, he just, he's in karate and he was going for his yellow belt and I kind of wanted him to fail. I kind of mm, wanted him yes. to, to fail the first one, but he passed and he did great, but, um, he's got to fail a lot. And I think I failed a lot in my life and that's the way, the reason why I succeed. And I know that I'm not going to succeed in everything, but I just need to succeed in most things. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I think that's the mental mindset that I've had my entire life. Um, I don't know if it was naturally in me, um, or I, I viewed it from the people that were around me and helped help raise me. Um, but yeah, I've, I've been blessed, super blessed in that, in that category. And also, um, my mom instilled me with so much confidence, yeah. you know, you can, you can do it. You can, you always can do it no matter what it is. And she made me step outside my comfort zone so early when I was young, when I was 16, she went and got me a job. Wow. She said, you're going to, you're going to help out. I'm going to get you a car, but you're going to get a job. So she went and got me this job, um, at this place called the Winchester mystery house. And it is a, um, it is a, uh, 
140 room Victorian mansion and they give tours and they say it's haunted and all this stuff. Yeah. But I, I had to memorize an hour and a half script. Wow. So, uh, but it made me, I can get up in public speak in front of 10 people or 10,000. It doesn't really matter awesome. because I was, I was getting those reps in early on. So like, I didn't know that that would help me where I'm at now, or if I needed to memorize something, right. I can, I can memorize it. And then you have to put your personality into it as well. And I was only 16 giving tours to toddlers all the way to 90 year old, you know, men and women, um, and everywhere in between. And you had to be, you had to be on that whole hour and 15 minutes. And uh, I think it, it, it taught me grit. It taught me how to work hard. It taught me how to, to show your personality. And I was, I was probably at that time more introverted. And I would say it just depends on the day. I'm mostly extroverted, but some days I'm introverted. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I think that's where my mentality came from. So yeah. I give... I give I give most, if not all, the credit to uh, to watching her and her putting me in different situations to either succeed or fail in understanding that I was going to be okay in either one of those results. That's fantastic. As you were talking, I heard confidence, adversity, and resilience, and mm -hmm. then excellence. So care which we goes with this whole thing, right? At first I was car because it's a vehicle, but then I'm like, we got to add the E because it's all about <laughs> the, the love. But I, I think, yes, your mom deserves a lot of credit. And you, as you said, it could have gone either way in many situations, but you chose uh, to win. I don't know if you've seen Sarah Blakely's um, interview about celebrating failure uh, and not fearing it as a, like, this is one of the reasons, I don't know if you know who she is, but she's the founder of Spanx and multi oh, yeah, yeah. woman, right? Yep, and she yep. has this whole talk about her dad uh, making her not afraid of failure. So you may want to try that with your son. I'm not a parent, so, you know, take that with a grain of salt. But I think it's sure. something that I tell all of my audiences about because when I heard that, I was like, yeah, because school just makes you so afraid to raise your hand because it's like, nope, next, <laughs> instead of celebrating like, yes, you gave it a shot, you know, yeah. so, you know, having that mentality would be awesome. Yeah, for sure. Okay. okay, so we've got the rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Favorite snack. What is it? Favorite snack. I'll say a protein shake. <laughs> nice. What brand? There's so uh, many. I, it's called Iso Pure. Okay. Uh, Iso Pure. Yeah, Are you a chocolate they, or vanilla guy? Or uh, So right now this one is cookies and cream that I have, but they have a chocolate version and they have a vanilla version. Okay. Um, they're not a sponsor of mine or any <laughs> of, the, of my affiliations, but I do love it. I so pure. pure. Um, it's, uh, it's like one of the lowest carb type of proteins, um, but it tastes like a milkshake. So nice. I, I love it. Okay. All right. And I so pure, maybe you should sponsor him. So reach yeah, out. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Um, your favorite flavor of ice cream since you talked about a milkshake. Is it cookies and cream? Nope, just vanilla. Vanilla just ice cream. Vanilla, vanilla bean. Yeah. Uh, okay. Just, I, I like it. Uh, I like to keep it simple. Yeah. I call that the gateway drug of ice cream because we all started <laughs> with vanilla. Nobody brought home like really fancy ice cream the first time. <laughs> yeah. We all kind of yeah. graduated to the fancy stuff, right? For sure. All right. Uh, if you could have one superpower, what would it be and why? Uh, I always wanted to fly. That'd be pretty cool just to be able to fly. Um, and so many, so many of the superheroes are able to have that ability. So I just yes. think if I wanted to get somewhere quickly, I could fly over there. Um, I don't think I would want to be invisible because I think that's just a little bit weird. You can kind of just snoop in on people and right. stuff like that. So that's a little bit weird to me. So flying, but what yeah, about you? I've yours? always thought the invisibility is for the criminals, right? Like, is it, yeah. like, I want to be able to rob a bank. I'm like, see, there yeah. you go. <laughs> yep. That's, that's, that's the one. Uh, well, well, let me ask you yours. Though. What is your favorite? Uh, I'm a teleporter actually. Oh, okay. Well, there's two. I've kind of come up with a different one. It's not really anyone's superpower that I know of, but uh, teleporting is my number one because I don't even want to fly. I don't want the bugs in my teeth or my hair. I'm sure I'm flying faster than a speeding bullet. So maybe the bug can't get on me, but yeah. I just want to get there. I don't really need the journey. I know it's not, <laughs> of course, there's something to be said for enjoying the journey, but if I'm going to Japan, I want to spend all my time in Japan, not on the plane. You know what I'm saying? And I know we're flying, but you get the point. So you just, uh, but, you just optimize the flying then. <laughs> yes, exactly. Now, my other uh, one is to be able to talk to all languages. So like plants, animals, people, mm -hmm. like I want to be able to just speak to everything. So that's that my would other be, one. That would be a good one. That's sure. a good one. That's a good one. All right. Uh, 
there, this one's interesting. Not everybody has an opinion on it, but so far everyone has had a thing. People are quite kind of passionate about this that I've come across. Uh, as far as toilet paper in your house, do you like it to be over the top or under the bottom? Uh, over the top. I think um, it's just the ease of use to get it down. <laughs> okay. All right. If it's wrong, if by chance someone puts it wrong on the roll, do you change it? So does it does it uh, does it deter us from winning? I don't think so. So I would not change it. There's other things in the house that are more important to the fa family dynamic than which direction the toilet paper is in. Nice. So yes, I would prefer it on the uh, on the front side or top. Um, but if it's going the other way, it's not as bad. I would rather, much rather have a clean house and everything else kind of right. in order rather than just that. So yeah. Okay. Nice. One, so though, then that means sure. you don't change it at other people's houses either. So that tells oh, me. Oh yeah. That. We definitely not. No, yeah. I'm not touching anybody's stuff. Uh, there are people that it. do. Yeah. Oh, I, I am not one, but there are people, I will change it at my house. I'm going to be honest. I will change it at my house. I'm not going to make a stink out of it. I'm not going to call a meeting and, you know, I'm just going to change it. But it, if, if it's, it's someone else, I'm a, I'm an over the top. I'm, I'm yeah. like you. I'm not, I'm not as passionate as other people like, oh, the original patent picture and like making an argument about it. I'm just hmm. like, look, I like it over the top. I don't really care whether it's the right way. I just know that's the way I like it. <laughs> So. Right. Now, now I'm going to, I'm going to look every single time just to make sure where it's at. <laughs> well, so. it has been brought to my attention. It might be a first world problem. And when you have other Ooh. things going on, it may not be so important. So that's why you probably yeah. never noticed. <laughs> yeah. I was like, Oh yeah, maybe I never thought about that with racial implications and class. Some people just don't care how their toilet paper is, but I do, yeah. when I do it with speaking events, I do ask my audiences if some people just have it on the back of the toilet or wherever, because everybody doesn't have it, you know, right. in a fancy place. Uh, and uh, well, this may be too much, but having since we do have children, we have wet wipes all, all, always. So that's important. Uh, yeah, but you'd have, you'd have to get the disposable ones because uh, we were flushing the wet wipes down <sighs> the toilet, and um, yeah, the plumber said uh, you have about uh, five thousand <laughs> sheets of. Uh, <laughs> It wasn't 5,000, but it was a lot. So yeah. we had to get that fixed at the house. Got it. Got it. Uh, who is your personal hero? I think we already talked about her quite a bit, but you can mention it again. <laughs> yeah, I would say my mom, but uh, my grandmother uh, is, is, is another one. If I didn't have to mention my mom, my grandmother, uh, you know, she's 92 years old. She still lives on her nice. own, still, has, still has all her own faculties, has a dog that she walks, uh, on their trail every single day. Like, uh, she's just, she's an, she's an ultimate, she's the, the matriarch of the family. And a lot of the stuff that we've done has trickled down, um, and, you know, most of her grandchildren are, are doing pretty well and uh, her children are doing great. And um, so I would just say, yeah, she she was she was the original and everybody yeah. else is kind of the remix. Um, but yeah, Grandma Elise Shanks. Nice, nice, nice. And what do you want to be remembered for? Uh, just as a good person, as a good steward, somebody that cared about more, uh, cared about people more than themselves. And, you know, as coaches and, um, and life coaches and mental performance coaches that, you know, we're, we're, we're hopefully doing it for selfless reasons. Although yeah. there are some selfish things that come with it, um, because you feel good by the work that you do. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and most people should, but, for the most part is giving up a portion of myself to hopefully help the betterment of humanity. So, and uh, I, I want to be remembered for a fantastic father. Like if, if my kids grow up and, and they, they have the same admiration I do for my mom, then I did a good job. And uh, yeah, always hopefully just be, being a good person overall. Yeah, absolutely. All right. One of the things that we didn't get to that I want to give you time to mention is your academy because we talked about the whole like, you know, being interested in other things. And one of the things is you you help with that because of the percentages of kids that aren't going to make it to the big dance in whatever sport it is. Talk, tell us a little bit more about that as we're closing out. 
Yeah, so we, we have a couple of different things. We have uh, Top Flight Elite Basketball Academy, and that's uh, 10 through 18 uh, travel basketball program. We also have football as well that we recently started the past couple of years. Baseball we've had too. And, um, yeah, we just uh, – a bunch of great coaches mentor these kids and, and coach them and, and teach them a lot of life lessons through their, their pers- particular sport. Um, we also have a gym that we own called Splash Lab where kids come and train and learn how to shoot like Steph Curry uh, and uh, Clay Thompson and everybody else nice. that can shoot, shoot the ball well. Um, so, yeah, those are the those are the things that we're doing. And we just – we did it because there's so many great people in our lives and we just wanted to make sure that we could do the same thing for other people and give back to our community. And uh, that's kind of how it all started. All right, Coach, you can't coach them all. I don't know why that was the way I wanted to say it because I was thinking of Pokemon. You can't catch them all. But yeah. what would you say to any young athletes or you know coaches that might be listening to this podcast as final words? I would say in all scenarios, be yourself. Make sure that you are authentic to who you are. Um, try to find out who you are first, you know, before you, before you kind of go with the norm or, uh, what everybody else is doing, you may not like that. And that may not be the path for you. And the path that is least traveled is probably the one that you need to be going on. So I would say, just be authentic to yourself, be who you are, uh, treat people in a nice way. You never know what's going to happen down the road or what door can open because you, uh, you, you, you either created a relationship or you or you terminated a relationship or didn't even start a relationship so be open to that sort of thing but Mm -hmm. at the end of the day be authentic to you know who you are um, and be okay with being vulnerable as well as asking questions of people that don't really know you or that you don't really know and if you do that you're going to open so many more doors for yourself Um, and uh, yeah yeah where can we connect with you uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn, Chris McSwain. Um, that has been the platform that's been great uh, during this last couple of years. But I'm on Instagram, Chris underscore underscore McSwain. And that's the same thing for Twitter, too. So, uh, yeah, that's where you can find me. Fabulous. Well, this has been a great conversation, Chris. I really appreciate you and uh, probably want to have you back and we'll talk some more basketball on the higher levels as well. So fantastic. Brand, you're doing a, a, a terrific job. I'm so, uh, so thrilled to be on your show, number one. And, you know, you're doing something that is so great and you're going to be impacting so many different lives. And who knows, you're probably going to be the next Trevor Moad, uh, but you'll be you'll be your own. You're, yes, you'll of be course. your own self, yes. obviously. But uh, yeah, just keep doing what you're doing. If, if, if you haven't heard it today, um, I'm, I'm just so thankful to have met you and connect with you. But you're just doing brilliant work and just continue continue to do that. Thank you so much.